finished. Um, my name is Dirk van Apendoorn, and uh, I was asked to tell you uh, something about uh, strip cropping uh, and uh, the advantages and disadvantages that you might see. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a research lecturer at uh, Wageningen University, and um, so I integrate teaching and uh, science, especially science in practice uh, with farmers. Um, why I work on this topic is uh, yes, it works. Is is that I'm I have a strong motivation to change the current condition that we are facing in the Netherlands. Um, if we see uh, what we have lost in the past 30 years, that's uh, we lost two thirds of the farmers uh, in the Netherlands, as you can see here, and we lost at the same period uh, two thirds of the biodiversity. And uh, that might be abstract uh, to you, but I was raised in a rural area. Um, and in uh, the 90s, all my neighbors were farmers. Uh, and I have very strong memories from uh, living in the countryside and experiencing all the beauty that nature offers. And if I now go back to the same place of my parents, there are no farmers anymore. And indeed, uh, most diversity that I used to enjoy is all gone. And my kids are now at the same age that I was in the 90s. So that's really, for me, a strong motivation to work uh, on this. So now I've given you um, uh, a short introduction about myself, but I would also like to know a little bit about your background. So I made a poll where you can uh, put in, uh, yeah, sorry, a, a bit about what your job is. Um, and now you should be able to see that. And maybe you can uh, um, vote uh, what your, uh, your background is or how you are here and you can uh, put multiple roles, uh, whatever, but uh, it's just for me, curious on what... Uh... So that is... Uh... Very nice that uh, <laughs> I see that there are many others. That means that we have a diversity of uh, people in the room, which makes it, of course, very interesting uh, for me. That uh, if you uh, feel like it, you can uh, put your role there in the in the others uh, section. But uh, thank you for uh, for answering. That makes my presentation a bit more lively. So um, let's uh, continue to what kind of diversity do we need? Uh, probably you all know. Uh, that the European Union is aiming at uh, more organic uh, in, uh, in Europe at 25%. But this summer also uh, a paper came out by ecologists and that say um, going organic is not enough. Um, and just organic won't save the biodiversity uh, in, uh, in the European Union. And uh, they basically claim that um, the organic or actually all agriculture is not uh, uh, grown enough different crops. At the right hand side, you see uh, the current area of different crops in the Netherlands and 55% uh, uh, is, is grassland. Uh, and then you have another 11% of maize um, and then potato cereals. But the interesting part is, is this other hand is this 4% of the land that's basically other uses. And that represents about 350 options that farmers can choose from when they have to register uh, their crops. So we are not using the diverse, the genetic diversity that is present. Uh, that's not, uh, farmers are not using it. And on the other hand, um, and that's the background of this, uh, this slide, our uh, fields are too big, are too large. Uh, this is a, a map of uh, the, uh, the Flevol polder, a very productive area in the Netherlands. And fields here are 40 to 60, 60 hectares uh, big. And that means that ecology cannot play its controlling role as it normally uh, would have. And it doesn't offer any habitat for biodiversity. So if you want to increase biodiversity, we have to go to more different crops and smaller fields. Um, and this is not the only paper uh, that showed it. Um, this was also published this just this year. This was a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. In total, 
50,000 different paired observations around the globe to see what the effect of crop diversity is. And uh, they showed that in general, the effect of crop diversity is positive. But uh, there's a huge uh, variation. So uh, there's no silver bullet, something that always works. Um, it really depends on where you are, what kind of diversity uh, you're working with to see the effect. But in general, we have positive effects and it is over and over proven. There's really a lot of evidence about that. But then the question is, is how are we going to do that? And uh, we submitted um, a paper for farmers uh, and for scientists. Uh, so how could we do that in the Netherlands? And we needed a new conceptual frame uh, for that because not all diversity is apparently the same. Uh, yeah, and you can uh, can find this paper on the internet's open access. Um, first, a little bit of theory, how does diversity works and why does it work so well? That's basically, uh, because, uh, well, let's say it like this, and it's well known uh, that diversity works, but we are not using it because in, with the Green Revolution, we were uh, used to reduce diversity uh, by plowing the fields, by uh, giving a lot of um, synthetic fertilizers, by using pesticides, etc. We could control all the environmental variation that is normally present. Um, to one condition and then our crops could grow fantastically well. In the, in the past, it was uh, a complement to a farmer, if you would say this is like a research station. And so control this, it, had, it was the objective to be like a research station. But if you uh, want to use uh, crop diversity, uh, then you have to allow for uh, heterogeneity in the field huh, or this environmental gradient. Uh, or the other way around, if you have a high environmental gradient, then crop diversity can work, um, as you can see on the left-hand side. And you can imagine that every type of crop or organism have its own optimum uh, functioning. And if you are able to put the right plant at the right moment uh, in the right place, then uh, you can have the, the highest efficiency and you can obtain uh, at least uh, the same yield level as with a very high external control. And this is about yield. And uh, on the right hand side of this slide, you can see uh, that it's not just about yield, but you can actually stack different kinds of surfaces by uh, using multiple varieties or um, species. So that uh, is the theory how it would work. But how are you going to stack it? And what is all diversity the same? And in, in this side, slide, you can see the conceptual framework that we use for um, uh, to define uh, diversity in a field. So I think that most of you think about diversity like biodiversity of having many different genes, uh, which you can imagine in a field if you would put different seeds in a bag, you shake, and then you distribute over the field. And the next year or the next season, you just do the same. And so it has a diversity of two, you might say. Another option is, is that you have a temporal diversity. You first have one, uh, variety of the seeds and then the next year or the next season you do the other one or you split uh, the area in two and you separate it uh, over the field that you have and all have the same diversity you might say but you can imagine that they have uh, different uh, functions and different effects so one such an uh, effect is um, the uh, reduction are less susceptible to uh, diseases. And this is a, uh, well, a bit classic uh, example. Uh, we were doing an experiment with faba beans and uh, our beans were not emerging. So uh, what's happening? Uh, and especially the beans that was um, a selected variety in POSA, uh, they were not emerging in the field. So uh, a student did some research uh, for me and he did uh, an emergence test, but well, the beans were fine. Uh, and then we took soil and put the seeds in and then the, our open pollination variety, OPF, was uh, go, doing fine, but our variety was uh, not emerging. And why? Most likely because there was a soil-borne disease in the, uh, in the soil and the imposa was not able to, to beat that disease. It didn't have the resistance to it anymore. 
and with the open pollination variety, you be, uh, yeah, you're spreading your risk, and they uh, were able to emerge. So something uh, happened, and that's also um, kind of evidence that we, we didn't select our crops anymore to be resistant to this kind of diseases, because normally you would maybe have used a fungicide, uh, for example. And so this is a nice example how you can spread your risk. Uh, if we are talking about fava beans, um, then you can also talk about other legumes, um, and uh, this was a study that we published also last year, is that uh, legumes can have many different ecosystem surfaces. So on the, the y-axis, we uh, uh, studied all kinds of different ecosystem surfaces they could provide, which are present in literature. And on the uh, x-axis, we uh, look into okay, what kind of uh, legumes are studied. And uh, this uh, was shocking to us because most of the scientists we work with, they like diversity, but actually even the legume scientists that really like uh, diversity, they are only studying very few crops. Eh? So pea, clovers, faba, beans and fetch, that those are studied. And then we mostly study yield and a bit of produce quality. But all the other ecosystem uh, services we uh, forget. So uh, that was for us a very important insight. If we want to increase diversity, we should maybe also study uh, different crops. So that is like genetic uh, diversity. The, the second dimension is uh, temporal diversity. And you can think of that uh, you can have long term um, temporal uh, diversity and by having a crop rotation. Within the season, you can have cover crops. And even in days, you can uh, use uh, relay cropping, and they have, of course, different kinds of effects. So here you see an example of what happens when uh, you have uh, a longer crop rotation with more different crops. Your uh, the number of weeds is uh, reduced. The wheat biomass, not necessarily, but in general, you have uh, fewer crops. And the nice thing is that we also know that you not only have uh, fewer crops but also that the uh, uh, number of species in your weeds is increasing. And well, you might think, why is that important? Well, the nice thing is, is that if you have more species in your wheat population, then there's also a, a, um, a lower likelihood that uh, they will be very competitive with your crop and they will most likely also give different ecosystem services. Um, currently, we have been selecting wheat for being so competitive. But if you have a high diversity, then uh, you have probably uh, a lot of wheat which are not so competitive with the um, with your main crop. Another um, advantage is, is when you uh, use relay cropping. And that's again a meta analysis on what this effect was. So you can imagine uh, that if you have uh, if you are growing two crops at the same moment, there is some kind of competition that can be for uh, sunlight that can be for water for nutrients whatsoever and the more different they are and the less competition you have um, and that makes sense if you would be able to grow two crops in one season then you have a double uh, use uh, the land and here we they show that if you uh, add, so intercropping anyway has a positive effect it has an effect of uh, about uh, 18 percent uh, additional yield but the more different you are in time, the higher that uh, difference can be with uh, a monoculture. And in the picture, you see an example of what is used a lot in organic agriculture. If you have um, a winter cereal, and then after the last weeding operation, you sow the, the clover in it and uh, they stay low. And once the uh, cereal is, uh, is harvested, then you'll have a very nice uh, clover sward. And so that's an example of uh, relay cropping. So we have genes, time, and now we go to space. Um, and again, you can think of uh, including uh, a flower strip in your field, or you can do strip cropping, the topic of this talk, or you can go even smaller to pixels or to plant level. And again, they have uh, different functions. Here you uh, see uh, the effect of space. And uh, we have, of course, been using a lot of, uh, of flower strips. A lot of policy has been uh, focused on that. But if uh, you check the, the literature again, then it basically shows that those effects uh, decline exponentially with distance. 
So if you want to make an effect with this flower strips, you need to have a lot of them. And anyway, don't put them near the road and where many farmers put them at the edge of the field because then you're pollinating the road rather than the field. So if they uh, have to be functional, please put them then um, in your field. And with strip popping, that's an option. Another very uh, topical one is, I think, uh, socially distancing with crops. And that's, we all now know what the effect is of um, separating uh, communities and with COVID now. And here you see um, the effect of a simulation of potato late blight. On the left hand side, you see uh, an image of how an, uh, the disease can spread through the whole field. And so they have hosts everywhere. The moment you start including um, resistant varieties or an other type of crop to potato late blight, then this uh, the speed of um, the spread is reduced. And so here you see an example what the effect would be of six meter strips and uh, three meter strips. And on the back uh, round, you see how we did it. It was actually two different type of uh, potato varieties. One resistant, the other was not resistant. And in that way, we could reduce the disease. So you can have diversity in genes, times and space, but of course you can uh, start combining it. And so if you start uh, stacking it and this, you get a kind of 3D uh, matrix you can imagine and different farming practices you can then put in this, um, in this framework. And this is still conceptual. We're currently really working on quantifying this, uh, this framework, but this is the idea. And the nice thing is once you start stacking it, indeed, it, it works. This is an example of uh, mixed strip intercropping, you might say. So we had not only strips, but also we start mixing with varieties in the strip. Uh, and you can see we, we had different colors of potatoes, so we could like also know what kind of potatoes were there. And you can see that in uh, the reference fields, the potato light, late blight entered the field and it well increased exponentially. We are, think, I, th I think, all now used to this kind of dynamics with COVID. Uh, that is uh, quite classical. But if you have six meter uh, wide strips, uh, some social distancing, you might say, then we can that um, uh, yeah flatten the curve, as, as we now say that. Uh, and the three meter even further. And if you start mixing in the six meter, and that has a bigger effect. You can have um, 14 days of difference before you have to uh, destroy your crop. And with the three meter mixed, uh, we could really have three weeks difference of, uh, of growing period for the potatoes. And that uh, yeah, really makes an, uh, a difference for organic uh, growers at three weeks of uh, additional growing time. So once you start stacking, uh, it works. Another example is you can go even further is that, uh, well, why would you grow um, in strips? Hey, you can even say, okay, let's really go to the uh, to the plant level and we start um, mixing uh, 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 crops basically in the, at the plant level. That's what we call pixel cropping. And uh, one of uh, our PZ uh, students did uh, research that and she compared uh, a reference a field and so like monoculture with all different kinds of diversity levels and she showed that uh, every increase in uh, diversity that can be variety or different crop species had a 10 percent less um, crop damage and by injury basically by by insects so uh, by having a lot of different uh, crops present or varieties present in your field we could really reduce the uh, the pests So I have now just given you some examples of uh, diversity and um, how what the advantages are. Now I want to ask again uh, in a poll to you: Is that indeed uh, are you convinced, huh? or should we give some more uh, <laughs> time to it? Or uh, of course, they can put into the chat and then. Uh, So I see that I still have some preaching to do, but uh, most of you that are present says yes, it's, uh, it works. And 
I think it's uh, I personally would say uh, somewhat because uh, in general uh, it works most of the time, yeah, but we really have to know when it works. And uh, the, the the strange thing is is basically that um, so if we know that it works, why are we not doing it? And that's uh, going into the next slide is that um, our current agricultural system is not suited for diversity. We are locked in, as we call it, in uh, in, in, in kind of uh, in scientific domain. Industrial agriculture, yeah, to let's say uh, maybe, well, at least the last 60 years we have been uh, <laughs> focused on that. And everything is uh, yeah, geared to facilitate it. Huh? So it has to do with how farmers um, are evaluating themselves uh, or yeah, among peers. So when are you a good farmer if you have big fields or if you have a lot of different crops? It has to do with consumers that just expect that food is always available and it's very cheap. Um, it has to do with our education that we have been training our farmers and our students that uh, have optimizing one part rather than the whole system. So optimizing a crop rather than the whole Example, why is it not? Yeah, uh, changing. So, um, and this is a nice example on how we are changing. These are experiments that we are doing with a farmer. So this is a commercial farm and uh, that wanted to, uh, to diversify. And uh, we put their fields now in total uh, 100 hectare to, to strip cropping. And uh, on purpose, we used fields very close to the highway and to the city. Uh, because they wanted to to show also okay this is uh, um, and this is possible but also they wanted to have a a discussion okay uh, with farmers and consumers okay what's happening here and is this uh, is there a future for this uh, and you can see how it looks uh, also very nice it in the landscape level it's a nice uh, nice view but of course uh, a question um, at first uh, what should you combine as a as a farmer what kind of crop should you uh, should you grow so this is an experiment that we started uh, last year and uh, that was um, you know which crops could we grow on uh, and do you want to grow in into a strip and it's basically based on uh, the crop rotation that they were also following in uh, their other fields so in uh, the flavor polar they have a an eight year long rotation and uh, then you uh, and and they use crop groups you might say so not exactly all the same but they have some uh, differences in that it can be uh, broccoli or cauliflower head but it's uh, the same uh, crop group and we uh, started up an experiment to see okay what are good crop combinations and also crucial in this experiment was uh, that we had reference fields and it are the the big blocks that you see here of um, and what. Well, our reference fields are two and a half hectare, which are tiny fields for the polder. We are in an environment of 40 hectares, but uh, for an experiment, uh, this is huge. Yeah? Most controls are like a few uh, uh, hundred square meter. So that was the first uh, question. Okay, what kind of crops are we going to combine? The, the second uh, question was, is, okay, what are we going to put next to each other because you might think that if you start strip cropping then you can just use this kind of uh, conveyor belt so that you just uh, move in uh, in time as um, as in space so that you that it all build each other but if you do that then you have a very big chance that diseases will um, uh, continue and you feel that they always it's always present so what we used is a um, uh, hop stop hop step rotation an example that you can see here for six crops uh, at the bottom how you could uh, make that um, but if you go uh, even more complex with uh, eight crops as you can see here then you get even more options so if you increase the number of uh, crops or genes in your system and you get of course more options also to combine in time and space so while you at first feel constraint has so not everything is possible anymore then suddenly if you start playing with more crops uh, they've got more options and in this overview um, 
then you can see that uh, what farmers have been uh, doing at the moment, all kinds of different options on how to, to start strip cropping. So some farmers, uh, and they use crop pairs, so they have just have two crops on one field, and the next year they have uh, other two crops uh, in the field. Um, or they make um, triplets or quadrats, uh, yeah, or having all crops uh, together. So there are all kinds of options to uh, yeah to start strip cropping. It's not necessarily always the same. I and mean, in all the designs that we have been making, no design has been the same. Every farmer makes its own kind of uh, design. And then the next question is, is uh, how wide should a strip uh, be? Uh, what is strip cropping? And then we go back actually to, um, to the farmers because every farmer has its uh, own reasons to start uh, strip cropping and uh, also its own uh, possibilities. So some farmers are saying, okay, I do strip cropping with 42 meet, uh, meter wide uh, strips. And uh, then they say, okay, I don't see any increases in yield. Um, and then that's quite obvious. We know that also from uh, other reports said that you don't have to expect any increases in yield if you have 42 meters uh, wide uh, strips, but you can have different effects. And I want to go through these effects from, uh, from the right to the left. So from very wide strips, why that works, and then go to smaller and smaller strips so uh if you for very wide strips um we know that it's uh, more uh well it's uh, uh <coughs> how to say that um you're hatching your batch yeah? so if you distribute your crops over different uh fields you're kind of creating a portfolio so if uh, one field is flooded or whatever uh, things happens as so you're then distributing uh, the chance that you have a crop failure of one uh, crop and you can uh, see it also on the left hand side where we had uh, in the flavor folder in uh, 48 hours 40 millimeters of rain and so disaster everything was uh, was flooded but the crops that were grown in strips had less damage because the the crops that were next to the cabbages in this uh, picture you see they were already harvested and most of the water went in uh, that um, uh, yeah in that strip so they were not as wet as monocultures on the other hand you can uh, change the climate yourself by uh, planting for example hedgerows or trees it's a lot of research now being done in agroforestry systems like hilly cropping and uh, everybody knows that uh, most crops don't grow well under a tree but what most people don't know is that trees have a positive effect in the long distance so they can have uh, um, effect up to 10 times the height of a hedge or uh, a tree line so that is this of a much longer area and that can uh, change for example the effect of the, the wind speed and you will have less uh, problems that your crops are uh, completely uh, wiped out of the field as happens quite often in the open areas of the Netherlands. So that this uh, yeah, reduction of the variation from the outside. If we think about biodiversity, what we see actually happening is that um, biodiversity is not only on the outside of the field and the, the margins, you might say, and that uh, a lot of um, flower margins that we used, they had only marginal effects because the biodiversity was only welcome at the outside. But once you start having a lot of different crops in your fields, then um, biodiversity is welcomed also in the field. It can, can uh, use the complete field. And this uh, was research being done by a student in winter, what kind of uh, animals were using um, the, the, the fields in uh, that experiment that I showed and it was quite clearly that birds were prefer preferring uh, the strip cropping systems and it's uh, quite uh, some birds that are there and those fields are crucial for these uh, birds in winter and they are feeding from uh, that area and on the right hand side you see uh, the effect of uh, strip cropping on mammals so what quite funny for our for us was that uh, near a forest and mammals go into the to the field and uh, then uh, they go back to the forest but 
yeah, the further you go from the, for, the forest, uh, then they're not present anymore. But the strip cropping, they stay in the field, so they can, yeah, they are not dependent on the forest anymore to uh, to uh, survive and to be present in the field. Also, with growing bigger and bigger fields, we are creating our own problems. So this was uh, a result of research that we did on uh, the effect of uh, industrial agriculture on the um, decline of insects. So our hypothesis was that um, uh, big um, monoculture would have a negative effect on insects. Uh, so we went into the field and start sweet netting uh, insects. And uh, yeah, to our surprise, actually, we caught most insects in the large scale monoculture that you see here at the top. And uh, on smaller fields, we had less insects and we had the fewest insects in our strip cropping system. But once we started looking on what kind of insects we were actually catching, then uh, all insects that we caught in the large scale monoculture were um, pests and so the, the cabbage moth was all uh, there present. Well, in our strip cropping uh, system, yes, we also had this pest, but also a lot of natural enemies. So they were controlling this outbreak uh, of pests. Uh, so uh, natural control was present there, well, but it's not present in uh, the large scale monoculture. The nature cannot do its job, you might say. So we have talked about ecological advantages. You might also think about um, practical uh, advantages from that a farmer can uh, use different strips. And this is an example on where we uh, reduce the effect on soil compaction. Normally, uh, heavy machinery has to drive over soil that has just been loosened by the harvest. And here you see an example of uh, potato harvesting. And by having uh, strips of grass next to the potatoes, then the heavy um, uh, keeper behind the tractor can drive over the grass strip, not doing any real damage to the soil, um, while the, the harvester can still take place. And these are like smart uh, combinations from a, a technical way. I showed you already the simulation of uh, potato lay blight and strips. And here you see some uh, real evidence of what is measured. This is seven years of uh, research of strip cropping. And every year we um, uh, did uh, monitoring of the potato lay blight in the monoculture and in the strips. And uh, the big message of this um, slide is basically that every year, in whatever location, we always had less um, uh, infection in the in the strips than in the in our reference. So that is a very robust uh, result, and this goes till uh, 2017, uh, I think. And we have been monitoring it ever since, and every year it's the same. Sometimes it's almost the same, and like this year, it was uh, we had enormous pressure of potato lay blight, but still we could see a difference in the, the monoculture and the strip, but if it's very, the infection rate is very high, and then it doesn't work anymore. It's like the condition now in the Netherlands with COVID, and then uh, nothing helps. But in general, it is a, um, a robust uh, uh, management strategy. And then we go to, to yields, uh, what makes uh, a good combination. So this was the, the yield of the uh, different crops in strip cropping, and we measured in the middle of the strip and uh, at the edges of the strip. So first we checked was the middle of the strip um, uh, different from a monoculture and was that yielding differently? Well, the six meter strips, that's actually always the same. And so there we don't see any effect of yields. But if you start measuring at the edges, then we do see a lot of effect. Um, and uh, what we especially see that uh, onions and oats are not uh, not so good, and so they, they uh, produce less than um, the the middle. Uh, they are below the, the below one, you might say, of the relative yield. For oats, uh, we can quite understand that because we have been breeding uh, cereals for being less competitive. Because if they are too competitive, then um, they they don't uh, yield well. And that was the green revolution, basically that. By uh, reducing competition, we could increase yield on the uh, field level rather than on the plant level. And onions, uh, they seem to be uh, very social um, 
crops. Eh? They are not so competitive. You can also think maybe of the, the routing system, how that works. Um, they are not, um, yeah. If you also think on how they grow eh? in, in, um, from an um, uh, ecological perspective, eh? they, uh, they don't take up a, a lot of space. So if you have something uh, uh, competitive next with then they uh, are reduced in yield but the other crops in general they increase uh, in yield and they uh, yeah they have a higher potential and this is of course just one year on one field um, but we are of course monitoring that over the long term and see how that uh, evolves so that's about with crops to combine but then we go into the next step is basically is what kind of varieties are a good combination because the crops that we are currently growing are all selected for monocultures, but they might not have the right traits to actually be good neighbors. And here you see uh, the effect of um, neighbors and crop varieties in pumpkins. We did an experiment with uh, pumpkins and uh, next to uh, grass clover and uh, lettuce and or spinach. And um, then we see that some, um, varieties do respond with stronger to a good neighbor than others. That um, the, the purple one um, in the middle at the left hand side, yeah, that's hardly any response to, uh, to the neighbors, while the dark green one in the top right uh, is giving a much higher yield. And not only in uh, kilograms, but also in the number of fruits. So it seems that, uh, that uh, yeah, Lettuce is a very good combination, or spin is a good combination for the for the pumpkins, and you can even see it in this picture here that on the right hand side the pumpkins are much more green, and uh, also if you would compare that with the, the reference, that was uh, yeah doing much better. So that seems to be a good combination. So. I'm going to ask you again, eh? so now I have given you uh, different functions of uh, strip cropping, and now I'm uh, curious, okay, is, is that um, uh, indeed something interesting uh, for you? So I start the poll. Let's see if I have convinced you or I uh, <laughs> need to work on my presentation. Yes, there's still uh, some people uh, very uh, critical. That's nice. It'd be great to have indeed a discussion later uh, on that. And I also see, um, uh, and I see a question of uh, Bram indeed in the, in the logistics. That's the next uh, part we uh, go into, uh, Bram. That's, uh... <laughs> okay, thank you for uh, all the votes um, because the question is, um, and what should we combine and what does it work? And we uh, did a study on uh, a meta analysis on uh, 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 intercropping of cabbages. So all data that is known about uh, combining cabbages uh, with other uh, kind of, uh, of crops. And uh, if you just look at increasing uh, yield, then onions are a very good uh, combination for um, for cabbages, but uh, grass clover, uh, living mulches are not so good. And they uh, decrease the the yield. But if you think about marketability, so that's the sizing of the the cabbages and and the quality, then living mulches do increase uh, the uh, yeah the, the production of the field. And also in reduction of pests and diseases, uh, onions and living mulches are uh, a good choice uh, to use. Uh, so de depending on where you are or what kind of objectives you have with intercropping, um, yeah, depends what kind of neighbor uh, you need. And it's not only um, your own objective, but also the kind of system you are working in. And so if you are an organic farmer or a conventional farmer, um, then you see different responses. If you're as a conventional farmer, uh, most of the time they apply a lot of control huh, with the, the plowing and the fertilizers and the pesticides, etc. So then intercropping is not 
uh, so profitable. But if we uh, want to um, allow more natural processes to take control, or if we are not allowed to use websites anymore, then intercropping becomes uh, interesting. And then we see indeed this uh, kind of uh, large effects. So it really depends on the kind of system that uh, you are working in, if it's uh, a good idea or not. And with that, it, so it really depend, depends on uh, you know, what kind of system you envision. Uh, so we have been working in this uh, big field set, this big monocultures where large machines are needed to make a profitable operation. Uh, that we have seen that more and more the machine got bigger, so then we needed a bigger field because otherwise the big machine is not prof profitable anymore and farmers were having uh, less uh, crops. So we can go to strip cropping and then um, we can uh, still hand use our current machinery and uh, have the, the advantages. So you need a different kind of crops or we can go to really uh, novel kind of kiln configurations where every plant has its own position and then you have a complete uh, different uh, field setup and, and looks. So that's important to keep in mind, okay, what, uh, what are the expectations of the system? And I want to share you a vision that we have developed uh, for the farm of the future. Uh, and in the past, technology was basically determining the agronomy. So in the technology, you might think only on the, uh, the, the heavy metal, but technology is also the kind of varieties that are present for a crop or uh, et cetera. And that was determining the, uh, the agronomy. And we see now actually uh, that we are stuck heavy uh, having all the problems, all the negative effects. So um, what if we look more into uh, ecology? Um, so what is the role of diversity in this kind of system? What can we learn from that? So can ecology inform um, agronomy? And then can uh, ecology inform technology so that technology can um, facilitate the interaction between uh, ecology and agronomy. So rather than uh, forcing a certain direction, it can really help this kind of interaction. And that is what we try to uh, develop at the farm of the future. And you can all look uh, at the website what we do um, to give farmers an, an option, okay, what the future could look like. To, um, to finalize this, uh, uh, this talk, I would really, I'm curious from, okay, some of you say, no, we should not uh, diversify it, so that um, don't bother. But for others, okay, what do you think most promising to, um, to diversify? And I uh, put in different kind of levels, huh? so we can uh, diversify at the landscape level, so that we have different varieties of crops for different soils or regions, and that's already present, that that's enough, or should we have uh, diversity at the farm level? So. Um, a variety that is very good as to have a different pre-crop or after crop or for different seasons uh, for a crop level huh? so uh, which crops are good combinations or even at the plant huh? so should every plant be unique um, so I'm curious what uh, the Bay of Public thinks in that uh, respect <laughs> So the crop level and the farm level are we're going at the same rate, but uh, most go now to the to the crops. It's uh, of course very interesting for the breeding companies as well. And what kind of crops do we then need, and uh, do we have the uh, the genes present to, to do so, and how should they respond? Um, with that. I uh, want to finalize my uh, my presentation. Um, what I can report is, so we have about 50 farmers in the Netherlands now uh, using strip cropping, organic and conventional. And they all report actually that, um, yeah, the yields, uh, they are not that interested in it, but they are say especially that having more diversity in the fields gives them more joy as they feel a farmer again, rather than someone that just follows the manual. So they um, um, are 
they feel a demand for their skills and they're going dump. Also that many farmers, they start small. I always say, and just first try two crops and not go all the way in once. Um, and then once they start, they uh, start diversifying more because they see how hey, uh, it works. So they it starts increasing and also uh, the ecosystem starts responding. And so you see that uh, over time diversity is increasing and that's uh, below and uh, underground. And the nice thing of uh, strip cropping is, is that we don't have to wait for novel technologies or new insight. That is, it's really in the hands of the farmers now to, to start and they can learn from diversity and what works for their farm because it's really important that it's based on their um, conditions and not that we have some um, book how, what they should follow. Every farmer uh, should have its own diversity. And uh, of course, I give the presentation, but I uh, base this on a lot of work of uh, other people in my team, which I uh, want to thank. And you can find more information on uh, the website or uh, use the QR code. And I see now some additional questions in the, the Q&A. And uh, one question is of Lisette Bakke, and what's the biggest disadvantage of strip cropping? Um, and I think that um, the biggest disadvantage is it's uh, the complexity so uh, we used to have handed uh, if you decide to crop um, and then you can go to the field and you start and now a farmer has to uh, to think beforehand uh, what strips are growing where and at what moment and uh, all the interactions and i think that novel technology can help a farmer with that but uh, the complexity is uh, is a challenge and of course there are uh, another disadvantages that uh, crops respond to their to their neighbors so it might be that uh, the uh, the cabbages at the edge for example are uh, bigger than the ones in the middle and uh, yeah what to do with uh, your harvest and so then you have to have multiple harvest rounds so how to deal with this kind of um, diversity and uh, a big disadvantage at the moment is, is that some crops you need uh, a minimum amount of area and so for spinach, for example, I think that they only come if you have uh, at least five hectare, otherwise they just don't come to your field. So they're, yeah, they are constrained in current uh, condition. Um, and then there is a question of uh, Semir, and that is what if grass piece a crop, say uh, a carrot, so that you mean if two uh, crops are next to each other and that uh, you have contamination? Um, uh, I think that that's uh, the question here um so we have been growing uh, grass and, and carrots next to each other and that's not uh, the best combination we know now uh, because the, um, the the grass is uh they are also host to a lot of uh, of mice of rodents and they uh, really like to be close to the carrot so the first line of carrots is uh, typically eaten um and so we had more damage but if you play with the type of grass or having a parsley rather than carrot, that's already less. Hard. So that we have to be uh, specific. Um, I don't sure if that's uh, answering the question of you, uh, Samir. But uh, is it? Are you? Yes. Was that uh, answering your question, uh, Samir, or not? <laughs> ah, sorry, I see now that uh, I went too fast. It's sorry for that. That's the problem of the um, uh, this way of uh, presenting. I will. Uh, I could not see your faces of if you've got it or not. If you have any questions that you still. Um, uh, want to see, I can uh, go back.
thank you, Lizette. Yes, well, uh, feel free to uh, put questions in the chat or um, the presentation will also be made available so that you can uh, look in on more relaxed to the different uh, graphs, of course. If there are uh, no questions, indeed, you're uh, free to uh, go to the next session or. Uh... Yes, Marjolein also indeed we're looking to agroforestry, but it's the next step to get farms to that. <laughs> 